Late last year, I shot a short film using my Panasonic Lumix S5 Mark II. This was a Halloween special video that I posted over on my guitar channel. Now, while shooting a short film can be very challenging, it's very enjoyable and also rewarding. And I encourage anyone out there who's got a brand new camera or any camera for that matter to go out there and give it a go. You'll learn plenty. While I've made a few thousand YouTube videos over the last 10 years or so for myself and other people, I haven't shot too many short films, and this most recent one was by far the easiest and the most organized. This video will cover the entire process from the camera gear, audio, color grading, and editing. If you've been thinking about shooting a short film, I'll give you some tips and tricks to make the process for your own idea a lot easier. Consider this my guide to shooting a short film. Let's get into it. All right, let's start with the concept and idea. I want to come up with something fun and relatable, not only to the guitar audience, which this video was going to be posted on, but anyone who grew up in the same period as me, watching classic 80s or even further back in the 70s, when it comes to horror movies and just weird movies. Coming up with a concept can sometimes be the hardest part. I love so many horror movie tropes, but the Lost in the Woods one is not only moody, but it's the cheapest and easiest to make. After brainstorming lots of different ideas, I came up with an idea that was to find a guitar I planned on buying that day out in the woods. Now, this guitar would cause some serious issues once I started playing it, so it was a sort of possessed guitar concept with elements of the Lost in the Woods thing. While I thought this was cheesy, it was the perfect idea to start the storyboarding. To say this was a low-budget production is an understatement. The goal here was to put something together nice and fast that didn't need anything elaborate or expensive. With the camera gear that I already owned aside, we spent no more than about 50 bucks on props, which included a few scary masks, horror blood, and lunches for the two shooting days. And that was it. Shopping at any discount store will give you amazing props for short films, whatever the genre. They have masks, costumes, and all sorts of cool bits and pieces to jazz up your set or film. Both the glass skull on this side and the zombie repellent flask on this side were both purchased at the same store for only a few bucks. Now let's talk about storyboarding. This is arguably one of the most important things of any short film because not only will you know as a camera person what is happening, but you can also share it with someone else and they'll know exactly what's coming up next or where they have to start. So this is a really cool thing to have. It really makes the entire process a lot easier. Now, while some people might go out there and try their best without using a storyboard, it means your idea is not very solid. If you can storyboard it, it means as you take it out to shoot it in the real world, it's going to work a lot better. When it comes to storyboarding, don't be too concerned. If you're not a strong illustrator, I can barely draw. So what I do, I just do really simple representations of what it is I want, whether the shot's a wide shot or a tight shot. And if there's any movement in the frame or if the camera needs to move, I'll add arrows to those panels with little information tags. Additionally, you can add one, two, three, and four if they're in some particular type of order in that one panel. So you know, okay, I need a wide shot of the car, I need a tight shot of the wheel, and then I need us getting out of the car. You can do all of that kind of stuff just in one panel or perhaps two. Just know the more time you put into the storyboarding process, the easier the end result will come. Going into this project, I knew two things. One, I'm a very visual thinker, so if I could visualize it, I could put it on the paper. And two, I also knew that there wouldn't be much dialogue in this. It's mostly just atmosphere and, you know, the concept itself. So rather than go into a whole script first and then go into storyboarding, I did it the other way around. I just put notes about what conversations were going to take place in each particular scene. And I wanted to keep it very sort of loose, very much like how Curb Your Enthusiasm was filmed where there's a concept for a conversation and a tone about it and that was it. So I'd bring up something like, hey, there's a garage sale over here, do you wanna go? And we'd just reply, oh yeah, sure, let's go. I also wanted to reference other movies in this short film, so I made notes on paper of when and where that dialogue would actually take place. Alrighty, let's talk about the camera gear, starting with the Panasonic Lumix S5 Mark II. This isn't the X, this is just the standard one. This camera did such a great job, and I wanted to shoot with this over my Sony FX3 as a primary camera for a few reasons, but one of which was the stabilization. The in-body image stabilization on this camera is so good that I can give it off to someone with far less camera experience and the end result looks professional. The IS boost mode can mimic a tripod when shooting handheld and this came in very handy, especially outside in the woods. While the final output of this project is the standard DCI 4K with a 17 by 9 aspect ratio, we ended up shooting in the 6K resolution with the same 17 by 9 aspect ratio 
which gave us more options in post if we needed to crop in or reframe. This was all shot at 42010 bit, so I could easily edit the files and I could also see all of my clip thumbnails on my Mac, which helps when it comes to sorting files. The three main lenses we used were the 50mm f1.8 prime lens as the primary, I used the 35mm f1.8, and for some of the wider angle fields of view, I used the 24mm f1.8. Now, these are all essentially the same size and weight, so if you do happen to use a gimbal, they work really well. These lenses are totally optimized for video, giving us next to no focus breathing. You don't need to go into your camera and turn on focus breathing correction and all that kind of stuff. These just work. Unlike what you hear on YouTube and filmmaking channels, we shot the entire video, or almost all of it, in autofocus. And why, you may ask. <laughs> We're a two-person crew, and the autofocus made life a whole lot easier for both of us. If one of us weren't operating the camera, the tripod was doing the work. The static shots intermixed with the handheld footage created the illusion of a camera operator, and the end result came up great. Sure, it would have been easier having a third person, but it also creates more stress, so a tripod and autofocus can be the ultimate help in producing low-budget short films like this. Now, diving into the profiles on this camera, I was going to shoot the whole thing in Vlog for total customization over the end result, but I ended up shooting the entire thing in the Cinelike D2 picture profile with the contrast and saturation pulled back a hair so I could grade it later and faster. In hindsight, I probably should have used the flat profile. It would have gave me a little bit more flexibility, but the Cine D profile gave me enough flexibility to get the look I wanted in editing. The entire video was shot using aperture priority mode and the camera did a great job exposing the outdoor scenes even with the mixed lighting conditions. The only other camera we used for this particular shoot was the Sony FX3. Now this is the FX30, but they look the same. And I wanted this for some of the slow motion dream sequence shots. I wanted to shoot this using 4K at 100 frames per second or 4K 120 if you live overseas. And this is something that the Panasonic S5 Mark II can't do. We only used one lens on the FX3, which was the 24mm f1.4 G Master, and this created a wide and dreamy look after some creative color grading gave me the look I was going for. When it came to the picture profile on the Sony, I could have used anything thanks to that heavy grading, but I chose S Cinetone instead of S Log3 just for productivity's sake, and it gave me a very similar but not quite the same look as Cine Like D2 on the Lumix S5 Mark II. Lastly, we used a GoPro Hero 9 and 10 for the car scenes. We had one on the outside of the car and another one on the back window for the driving shots. Now sure, the GoPro shots don't have the same niceness as the full-blown full-frame mirrorless cameras, but it worked great and it added to the story and it was a shot I was unable to do due to not having the right tools to mount this to a car. And I much prefer if a GoPro takes a tumble over a really expensive camera because they're kind of designed for that. So yeah, the GoPros actually fitted in way better than I thought, even though they looked a little noisy. And when it comes to audio, we used two audio packs, including the Godox MoveLink 2 Mark II and the Rode Wireless Go 2. That's a lot of twos. <laughs> we had some lav mics attached to our shirts and jackets and the audio came up fine. The mics weren't super concealed or anything like that, but it was a fun project and it didn't matter much to us. All right, now let's cover lighting as it was very simple. I used some Ulanzi RGB lights to create some funky colors inside of the house. And it's what I'm using right behind me right here. And I also used the Pixel P80 LED panels, which I'm using in the studio to create the lightning effect or anytime I needed a light inside of the house. These lights are fantastic and I did a full review on them. They're a really great addition to any studio. If you want to check them out, I'll link them down below. Everything shot outside was just natural lighting, thanks to the sun. Now, due to the mixed lighting conditions, I left the camera again in auto, white balance mode, and it did a great job maintaining the correct color in all of these different situations. Now let's talk about the filming process because this was a bit unusual considering we were not only the actors, but also the camera person. <laughs> so this was a little bit of a challenge, but basically most of the standard shots that you'll see in the short are the standard combination of wide or establishing shots, tight or close up shots. So nothing out of the ordinary there, but we had to really pick and choose which lens to use and why. And this came back to referencing the storyboarding. I can't stress enough how invaluable this was. We called this the Bible when we were out there in the park because it made it so much easier for us to actually finish what it was we were trying to do. Now, if we came into a situation where we didn't think the shot worked or the dialogue kind of sucked or whatever, then we'd sort of try some different things on the fly but capture the idea and essence of what it was that we had on the storyboard. So if something just didn't come out naturally, we'd then shoot it a couple of different ways or even try a different focal length at that particular point to make it work. But we followed the storyboarding. Anytime we shot the dialogue scenes, we used a wide and a tight focal length, which means we ended up doing it two or three times to get 
a shot of me, shot of Rhiannon, and a wide shot as well, which gives you that illusion of a camera operator. Now, when you're shooting, it's really easy just to set a tripod up in one position, but I also recommend getting a small tripod, whether that's something like a Manfrotto Pixie tripod or any other brand, so you can get some low to the ground shots. These added a different sort of touch to the production that we wouldn't have been able to get just by using standard size tripods. One of the things I didn't put in the storyboarding was coverage shots. So I'd look at a scene when we pull up in the car and I noticed that there was some barbed wire. There was also some no trespassing signs and I thought these will add that sense of dread. And I just did all of this handheld with the S5 Mark II and it came up looking really great. So make sure you get your coverage shots when you're out there on location as well because otherwise you're going to have to go back. So just keep that in mind. Let's talk about the editing process. So as soon as we were done with a particular scene, I take the SD card out put it in my computer and put all of those files into a folder that was labeled correctly. And then I can follow the naming convention on the files to know which order they're in. When I import that into Final Cut, I can see exactly what order and scene they're from, which is great. You can go one step further and label every individual file if you need to, but I don't need to do that. The number scheme works great. Within Final Cut, I would then set up each scene as its own project, which meant I could then correspond that particular project to all of those files. I would also set up a title one as well for my title clip that I would then import into the master track at the end. So basically it's like working with four or five different videos and then at the end you're combining them all into one project. Now the benefit of this is you can color grade per scene, you can set up the music per scene and all that kind of stuff and then import all of them to a master project at the end. This means if something goes wrong, for example, you can then go back and correct a short, much shorter scene than trying to reorganize lots of different clips on one timeline. Now, if you wanna work on one timeline, you can go ahead and do that. But after doing a few of these now, I know that working in individual clips or scenes is a lot easier than having to do a master project from the start, especially once you start incorporating music and sound effects, which we'll talk about in a moment. After all of the files are on the timeline in the corresponding project, then I would go ahead and fix up any of the dialogue, which meant I may have to add a compressor or change the EQ of the voice slightly or change the volume of each of us on screen to match. And the audio of the dialogue is one of the most important things. So do that first, and then you can incorporate your music later and adjust the music according to the voice in the clip. If you do all the voice actors audio first, it will save you the hassle of going back later on after you've added all the different sound effects to try to make it loud enough. So do it first and work around the dialogue. It's a whole lot easier. The next thing I'd usually do is cut the scenes in order while experimenting around with different music and sound effects per scene. This meant going into the YouTube audio library and pulling some great sounding music for each scene, for example process of picking the right song for the job is trial and error so download anything you like the sound of and see if it fits the mood this process took me over an hour to find the right tracks for the scenes but it's definitely worth it one thing that people don't realize is that youtube also have a sound effects library i covered all the main sound effects from the windows car doors low frequency thuds stumps and zip noises all from the youtube library there's also a handful of clips from final cuts free library i used as well but that was it if you use the search tool, you can find a lot of great sounds and music and it's all 100% free, so give it a shot. Once I had the scenes in the timeline and the music applied, I started thinking more about the color grading. I think of color grading pretty simply. If the scene is low tension or light in its overall tone, then stick to the standard colors. Once the short film got eerie or scary, the tone of the color grading changes. There's no hard and fast rule here, but I managed to get a great look that I was happy with both indoors and out. Now transitions are usually kept to a minimum unless they add something to the story like a fade to black or to convey some sort of sense of time. Nearly all of the transitions are hard cuts except for a handful of scenes when it added to the story. I wanted to separate this project from a typical YouTube video and I wanted to keep it more in line with a short film or horror film that I had as reference. The editing ties it all together so spend as much time as you need scene by scene. Try to cut out as much as you can while moving the story forward. We shot quite a few scenes that never made the final cut because it didn't move the plot forward whatsoever. The last thing to do is finalize each scene, proof it several times, and mark it as complete. Once I got the rest of the scenes done, I could then go back in and add titles and credits and then copy each of the edited scenes to a brand new master timeline. At this point, I could add in any transitions that I needed to between each of the actual projects in the master timeline. I usually run a compressor and limiter to the master file as well. It's known as adaptive limiter in Final Cut. 
And this is a great way to balance out the volume if there's any discrepancies. I hope this video has been helpful. And if you've enjoyed it, please leave a thumbs up. If you want to check out my cheesy little short film, I'll link it down in the description box below. Catch you soon. See ya.